Hi, I'm Nick Tatarnik, Curator of Entomology at the Western Australian Museum. And today I'm going to be talking to you about some work that I've been doing with my colleague and friend Fernando Sole from UCLA. So before I start, um, I just want to apologize for not actually being there in person or virtually there in person. I'm currently down in the southwest of Western Australia in Walpole, working on a project on peatland ecosystems, um, just to give you a little idea of what I'm doing. I'm hunting these wee little flies, or more specifically, they're maggots. Because, so these flies are ant little ant mimetic wingless flies, and the females lay their eggs in pitcher plants, um, this endemic Albany pitcher plant. And essentially, we're doing a population genetic study looking at um, fragmentation of the population of both the ants and the pitchers. So that's where I am right now. Okay, on with the show. As some of you might recall, Fernando gave a talk on this subject last year. Today I'm going to give a little bit of a uh, recap and then uh, talk about some of the work that's happened since then. All right, so sticky trap predation is a behavior of using sticky substances to catch prey, as the name suggests. And in assassin bugs, it occurs in the Bactrodonae and Harpactorinae. The sticky material can be collected from the wild or can be made by the insect. This is a picture of the genus Amulius from Borneo, and it's coated its forelegs with tree sap, I'm guessing, and is chowing down on an ant. For those bugs not lucky enough to be able to make their own stickiness, they have to gather it from the environment, typically from plant resins and sticky plant exudates. This picture shows a leaf beetle in Vietnam digging a circular trench in an aeroid in order to cut off the flow of sticky latex that, so that it can feed on the leaf material on the inside of that circle. Here in Australia, one of the dominant sticky plants in our landscape is Triodia, which is commonly called spinifex. There's several species, some of them are sticky, some of them aren't, but the ones that are sticky have these um, glands that produce and secrete this sticky substance that coats the entire leaf and it's, um, it's quite sticky and it burns well as well. A long time ago, back in 2016, Zhang et al. published a paper where they looked at the global pattern of sticky trap use in assassin bugs. Here you can see the stickiness mapped onto the tree. In yellow, those that don't use sticky predation. In red, those that gather plant resin. In blue, those that scavenge on plants with sticky trichomes, and in green, the lucky ones that make their own sticky substance. In their global treatment, Zhang et al. showed two origins for resin gathering and even more for trichome use. It was pretty cool. Unfortunately for those of us in Australia, though, the um, coverage of Australian taxa was limited, and none of the Australian specimens used um, were of species known to use sticky trap predation. But we do know that sticky trap predation does exist in Australia. In 1991, Malik Malipatil described two monotypic genera, Enduia reduvius with the species Enduia reduvius aquilonius, and Goroduvius with the species Goroduvius westraliensis. In this paper, he briefly noted that Enduia reduvius were observed gathering the sticky exudate from Triodia, presumably to assist in prey capture. So that's Enduia reduvius aquilonius there. And just a couple of years ago, Fernando found a new species of Goroduvius, so that's what's seen in this image, and they were also discovered collecting Triodia resin. So this became the springboard for our current collaboration. Here's a paper that Fernando and Marielle Herberstein wrote based on Fernando's initial efforts, where he demonstrated that resin use enhanced the bug's prey catching efficiency. And this picture here shows our new species of Goroduvius. It can be distinguished from Westraliensis by the all orange antenna versus just apically yellow. The um, hind femora having a colored band versus the fore femora in Westraliensis. And also the male genitalia is strikingly different. Interestingly, both species have been found in the same locality a couple of times and they apparently do the same thing. They both seem to hang out on the triodia. They both seem to be hunting ants. So I'm really interested in how they avoid competing with one another. In any case, I just want to point out in this picture, 
one thing that uh, characterizes these bugs is the tips of the four tibia have this dense bristle of spatulate um, setae, and they use these for scraping the resin off of the triodia and then smearing it over their bodies. Right, so do other bugs in Australia do this? Well, I've seen sticky assassin bugs before. I just assumed it had been documented, but it turns out not. And working at a museum, I have a collection at my hands with lots of bugs in it that I can go through. Fernando and I both like going places with lots of bugs, so we decided to put in a grant with the Herman Slade Foundation to look at sticky trap predation in Australia more deeply. A few years ago, during COVID, I traveled to Cape Range, about eight hours north of Perth. While I was there, I found a couple of species of assassin bugs hanging out in sticky triodia. They seemed really shiny and were coated with resin, so I decided to watch them a bit more closely. The most abundant of these assassin bugs is this uh, mostly orange and black species. This is Poslus phodrus gradiosus, as far as I can tell. And observing them, I saw a lot of them were hanging out on the ground, in particular at the openings to ant nests. So I spent a bit of time watching this and got a couple of good pictures and some video. Unfortunately, it was a new camera and I didn't really know how to work it. So I missed the best stuff, but I've got a little bit of footage here that shows um, a bit of their predation. So this is a bug just after it's grabbed an ant. So it had been sitting there striking at any ants that had walked out of the ant nest and mostly missing them. But when it finally grabbed one with its forelimbs, it promptly dragged it in, stabbed it. And then what they typically were doing was after they caught an ant, they would then climb up onto the vegetation nearby to feed on it. And what was funny is actually looking in the triodia, you'd see a lot of dead ant husks sort of stuck to the, to the leaves. So I'm guessing the assassins had come down grabbed some ants, fed on them, and then wiped them off their arms onto the plant to get rid of them. Cute. Okay, back to the broader question at hand. Given we know that sticky trap predation does exist in Australia and appears to be practiced by at least a few species, figured it would be interesting to examine this from a phylogenetic perspective. So we took the existing data from Zhang et al. and added an additional 75 um, Australian specimens, giving a total of 205 terminals. Then sequenced the same genes and ran the analysis through IQ tree. All right, so here's the phylogeny, and within this red box, this is the Bactrodonae and Harpactorinae. And the topology has changed a wee bit since the Zhang et al. paper, but it's more or less the same. But what I want to draw your attention to are these two clades here. These are Australian taxa that have been found covered with resin in our collection, or that we've observed gathering resin. So focusing on this first um, clade, we have up here, this is, um, this is actually two genera um, highlighted in blue, Trachylestes and Undia reduvius. So Undia reduvius remembers the, um, that genus that uh, Mali Patil described, gathering resin. Trachylestes, also seems to be doing the same thing. All of our specimens are coated with resin and we've been collecting them off of triodia. And from this tree, there's we don't have enough samples really to tell, but it's I still need to look at them a little closer to see whether they're really one genus or whether there's more going on here. And then we have Gora reduvius. So this is, um, again, this is a picture of the new species that uh, Fernando and I are describing. The one thing that unites these is that they all have these spatulate uh, bristles on the tips of the um, four tibia. The other thing is that they also have this uh, unusual genitalia. So this, the adiagus is um, apically divided into paired um, lobes, so multiple paired sclerotized and membranous lobes. This is only partially inflated. I couldn't get it to inflate all the way, but you get the idea. All right, so if we look at uh, the next big cluster, um, so up at the top we have Postal of Dallas Formosus. This is a 
the species, it's, an, it's a monotypic genus, this um, species does not collect resin. And then everything else on the tree that's colored pink has, at least in our collection, has been identified as Poesilus phodris. So the genus Poesilus phodris currently has one species. species. I think it's um, gradiosus, but there's a lot of variation in color. And then when I've started dissecting them, there's a bit of variation in the genitalia as well. So let's start off up at the top. We have this wee little guy. This is um, the one on the left is the bug collected from Cape Range, but I've also found the same color variant up in uh, the Kimberley, which is a bit farther north. Um, and then you also see some with this nice orange, black, and uh, yellow patterning. And I'm still not sure whether I'm looking at two species or one species here. I need to do more sequencing and look at some more genitalia. Next cab off the rank, we have this clade here. This thing, the color seems to be, it's fairly variable. I've seen in, within a, a given population either fully black to this black and orange coloration, again, with different genitalia and some other subtle character differences. And then this last bunch, which I'm currently just calling all one thing. This is Poesos Fodris. Um, and across Australia, the color is hypervariable. Genitalia seem to be fairly consistent. Now, all of these things have in common that the uh, the bristles on the the CD on the um, front tibia are not spatulate, but they're a little bit curved at the tip. But they're often found caked with um, resin. So when you look at them under a microscope, you see that they they've been either scraping resin or somehow walking through resin and getting gummed up. And if you look at their genitalia, the typical genitalia across um, both Poesilobdalus and almost all of these Poesilus phodris type things is fairly simple adiagus with uh, the apex sort of has two um, hemispheres with uh, covered with um, sclerotized uh, spines. But these little guys up in the top, their genitalia is a little bit different. It has that same sort of bilobed... Um, main uh, part to the adiagus, but then a second bilobed branch coming out. And this one, again, it's, I couldn't fully inflate it, but if you tug on the um, that bilobed uh, bit on the bottom, it actually extends out into a fairly long accordion um, eversible sac. So yeah, the genitalia is quite different. All right, so what comes next? Well, there's the taxonomy work, so we're finishing off this description of this new Gora reduvius, looking at the Trachylestes and Undia reduvius complex, and then there's the Plesos phodris and this little thing that is probably not the same genus, and yeah, there's, there's a bit more to go on, but um, at least there's a few new species in here to describe. And another thing that's kind of interesting this is a photo that was sent to us by a billionaire who was on vacation up in um, up in the Kimberley. So it was, he emailed someone in government who handed that to our CEO, who then sent it down to us minions without any contact details, because of course we're not allowed to talk to billionaires. And they wanted to know what the snotty looking thing was. So, so that blob that looks sort of like a smoker's lung is actually the nest of a, of a resin bee, so Tetragonia or Australebia, Australebia, I can't remember the genera. Anyway, it's a, it's a resin bee hive. But what was interesting to me is this guy in the corner. So this is clearly Gorreduvius, and I'm guessing it's been actually sneaking up to this resin uh, bee nest and stealing resin from the bees. And that would be a pretty cool thing to, um, to document. Another thing that um, has interested me and Fernie is um, maternal care. So previously it's been shown that in um, some of these sticky trap uh, assassins that the females will cover their eggs with resin. And just recently a group published a paper showing a couple of species in Southeast Asia or in Asia um, that were gathering resin and then the females were ingesting it up their um, genitalia or into paired glands that um, they stored the resin that they could then apply to the eggs. 
So Fernando, when he was in the field, he saw females rubbing resin on the tips of their abdomens and he decided to look a little bit closer. So if you look at this CT scan, when you look inside, um, here we go, you can see a cut this big mass of resin and sand um, divided into these two clusters to either side of the midline. So I suspect the same thing is going on in this as was described in those Asian species. So it remains to be looked at in more detail and we also want to look at the other species that are coated with resin to see if they're doing this as well. And that brings us to the end of the talk. Um, I just want to fa thank the Herman Slade Foundation for funding this research. Bush Blitz, which is a species discovery program run in Australia, which uh, is kind of the only way we get out of the office these days. Um, and then Nerida Wilson, Melissa Danks, Joel Huey, and Mia Hillier, who did a lot of the sequencing work. And of course, I want to thank all of you for listening. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be available for answering questions. It all depends on the internet connection down here in Walpole, so I may or may not talk to you now-ish. Thanks.